Good afternoon. My name is Jamie and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to Trinity Capital's fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings conference call. Our hosts for today are Kyle Brown, Chief Executive Officer, Michael Testa, Chief Financial Officer, Jerry Harder, Chief Operating Officer, and Ben Malcolmson, Head of Investor Relations, Ron Kundich, Chief Credit Officer, and Sarah Stanton, Chief Compliance Officer and General Counsel, are also present. This call is being recorded and will be available for replay beginning at approximately 3 p.m. Eastern. The replay dial-in number is 800-839-7414, and no conference ID is required for access. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions following the presentation. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If at any point your question has been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star 2. We ask that when posing your question, please pick up your handset to allow optimal sound quality. Lastly, if you should require operator assistance, please press star 0. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Trinity Capital's Head of Investor Relations, Ben Malcolmson. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jamie, and welcome to Trinity Capital's earnings conference call for the fourth quarter and full year 2023. Trinity's financial results were released today prior to the open of the financial markets and can be accessed from our investor relations website at ir.trinitycap.com. A replay of the call will be available on our website or by using the telephone number provided in today's earnings release. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that certain statements that are not based on historical facts made during this call, including any statements relating to financial guidance, may be deemed forward-looking statements under federal securities laws. Because these forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties, there are important factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by these forward-looking statements. We encourage you to refer to our most recent SEC filings for information on some of these risk factors. Trinity Capital assumes no obligation or responsibility to update any forward-looking statements. Please note that the information reported on this call speaks only as of today, March 6, 2024. Therefore, you are advised that time-sensitive information may no longer be accurate at the time of any replay listening or transcript reading. Now, please allow me to turn the call over to Trinity Capital's CEO, Kyle Brown. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Trinity delivered record fourth quarter results to round out a tremendous year for our platform. In 2023, we advanced our strategy, significantly grew the platform, strengthened our balance sheet, diversified our portfolio, and enhanced multiple revenue streams, all to the long-term benefit of our shareholders. Most notably, we outperformed across multiple operating metrics, setting several financial and performance records throughout the efforts of our incredibly talented team. Headline accomplishments include record quarterly fundings of $267 million in Q4, contributing to a record year with $642 million of total fundings in 2023. Platform AUM growth of 29% year-over-year, pushing our assets under management to approximately $1.5 billion and a record $90 million of net investment income, up 26% year-over-year. This exceptional performance allowed us to increase our quarterly dividend to $0.50 cents per share in the fourth quarter, making this the 12th consecutive quarter we increased our regular dividend. In the face of industry-wide pressure from disruption in the banking industry in 2023, we emphasized our proactive portfolio management strategies and partnered with borrowers to navigate a challenging operating environment while continuing to grow our assets under management. Additionally, we continue to invest in our platform by growing our team, scaling the strategy, which we believe widens our funnel as we pursue attractive investment opportunities across the ecosystem of growth-oriented companies. We've organized our business around distinct vertical market opportunities, tech lending, life sciences, equipment financing, and warehouse lending, each with its own dedicated originations, credit, and portfolio management teams. The performance of our life sciences vertical provides an excellent example of Trinity's commitment to scale and, and asset diversification. We launched this business vertical in 2022 
And since that time, we've opened a satellite office in, in the location of San Diego and hired best-in-class talent to expand our deal teams. As of December 31st, 2023, our life sciences portfolio sits at approximately $183 million on a cost basis and represents nearly 14% of our total, total portfolio. Within our tech lending vertical, we continue to grow our footprint by adding proven, experienced talent to our deal teams. In 2023, we expanded our East Coast presence with the appointments of three new originators in New York and Boston, giving us a regional footprint in several major tech markets. We also began to realize the benefits of our direct lending joint venture in 2023. As we've mentioned in prior earnings calls, this off-balance sheet vehicle provides incremental capital for growth and accretive returns to our shareholders. In Q4 2023, the joint venture provided approximately $1.1 million of interest, dividend, and fee income to the BDC, and had $153.4 million of assets at fair value as of December 31st, 2023. We ended 2023 with a strong investment pipeline, including $358 million in unfunded commitments. But as a reminder, many of our unfunded commitments are subject to performance milestones, and all of Trinity's unfunded term loan and equipment financing commitments are subject to ongoing diligence and approval by our investment committee. We will remain very selective and committed to adhering to our disciplined deal selection and credit underwriting process. And as a result, we're seeing larger and more mature businesses enter the pipeline. This is great momentum as we head into 2024. As we said before, our team is the cornerstone of Trinity's success and will be the key to our growth moving forward. We are committed to creating a unique culture of excellence that is built around our six pillars of humility, integrity, trust, uncommon care, continuous learning, and entrepreneurialism, all of which create the differentiated lending platform that we've built here at Trinity. We strive to provide value above and beyond expectations to every part of the Trinity platform, whether that's employees, clients, or investors. And as an internally managed BDC, our structure allows us to maintain 100% alignment with our shareholders' best interests. Another key factor is that as a direct lender, we continue to own our pipeline, with originators strategically located around the country to bring in opportunities through deep relationships with sponsors, banks, and operators. For Trinity, the commitment to our portfolio companies and the relationships we've developed as a result allows us to invest in a wide array of opportunities supported by quality sponsors. In 2023, an aggregate of nearly $3 billion was raised by 45 of our portfolio companies. Our high-quality portfolio companies continue to secure the funding they seek, and Trinity continues to be a less dilutive source of growth capital for them. We focus on doing three things exceptionally well here at Trinity, exhibiting uncommon care for our employees and partners, being more than just money for our clients, and providing outsized returns for our investors. We expect 2024 to be a strong one for strong for sponsor-backed growth-oriented companies, providing us with the opportunity to continue to expand this platform. We look forward to continuing this trajectory into 2024 and in the years to come. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Michael Testa, our CFO. Mike? Thank you, Kyle, and welcome to everybody joining us today. As Kyle mentioned, we set records in several key areas in 2023. In Q4, we achieved record total investment income of $48 million, a 15% increase over the same period in 2022. Total investment income for 2023 was $182 million, a 25% increase over 2022. Our core yield on the portfolio for Q4 was once again strong at 16.7%. Our core yield, which excludes non-recurring fee income, was 15.2%, down slightly from 15.5%, Core yield in the prior quarter. Net investment income for the quarter was a record $25.1 million, or 57 cents per basic share, an increase of 16% compared to $21.6 million, or 62 uh, cents per basic share from the same period of the prior year. Our net investment income represents 114% coverage of our quarterly distribution. Having out-earned our regular and supplemental distributions throughout 2023, we ended the year with more than $64 million in undistributed income, or approximately $1.39 per share. Our platform continues to generate strong returns for our shareholders with ROAE based on net investment income over average equity of 16.9% and ROAA based on NII over average total assets of 8.3%, all while operating with leverage at the low end of our target range. 
As of December 31st, 2023, net, net asset value increased 7% to $611 million, and NAV per share increased by $13.19 per share, up two cents from Q3. Year over year, NAV per share increased four cents from $13.15 per share. This increase in NAV was primarily the result of record net investment income exceeding the company's declared dividends and accretive equity offerings. Moving to liquidity, as of December 31st, 2023, we had total liquidity of $142 million comprised of $137 million of undrawn capacity under our credit facility and approximately $5 million in unrestricted cash and cash equivalent. Additionally, we have continued to co-invest with our joint venture, which provides additional investment liquidity and as of December 31st had approximately $100 million of uncalled capital and availability on the JV's credit facility. Our net leverage ratio, which represents principal debt outstanding plus cash on hand, was 1.05 times as of December 31st, 2023. Our strong liquidity position and the fact that we're currently at the lower end of our targeted leverage range provides Trinity with the flexibility to manage a strong pipeline and be opportunistic in the marketplace. During the quarter, we expanded our ATM program and added another sales agent. In Q4, we raised approximately $46 million in proceeds at a premium to NAV, further supporting the long-term growth of Trinity. I will now turn the call over to our COO, Gary Harder to discuss our portfolio performance and platform in more detail. Gary. Thank you, Michael. Trinity Capital experienced tremendous growth in 2023. As we continue to scale and diversify our platform in 2024 and beyond, we're hyper-focused on maintaining our disciplined and systematic investment approach, as well as the culture and core values that have been the driving forces for our success and which differentiate Trinity from its peers. The composition of our portfolio remained consistent with prior quarters and shows diversification across investment type, transaction size, industry, and geography. We've intentionally constructed a portfolio with varied segmentation across 21 industries, with our largest industry exposure, space technology, representing 14.1% of the portfolio at cost. As mentioned earlier, our life sciences portfolio represented a total of 14% of our portfolio at cost, and was further comprised of a mix of medical devices, healthcare technology, and biotechnology with minimal regulatory exposure. Equipment financings represent 25.5% of our year-end portfolio on a cost basis. I'd like to address one investment in our equipment finance vertical. We recently announced the commitment of a $120 million in aggregate equipment financing to Rocket Lab, a leading provider of space launch services and advanced satellite technology. This deal closed just prior to year end and shows on our year end schedule of investments with a cost and fair value of $108.4 million for the equipment financing. However, subsequent to year end, and in addition to three scheduled amortization payments, the company repaid approximately $40 million of principal. Additionally, we syndicated a portion of the remaining principal to our joint venture, bringing our investment in Rocket Lab to approximately 4.5% of our debt portfolio on a cost basis. During Q4, early debt repayments were in line with our historical average, totaling $43 million, including an early payoff of our digital asset equipment financing to HUT-8 following the completion of their merger. We also received $41 million in scheduled repayments and $25 million of proceeds from sales to our joint venture. Shifting gears to credit, the credit quality of our portfolio companies remains stable, with approximately 96.5% of our portfolio performing on on a fair value basis. Our average internal credit rating for the fourth quarter stood at 2.7, based on our one to five rating system, with five indicating very strong performance. This rating is in line with our average credit rating in each of the last four quarters and reinforces Trinity's track record of low loss rates. At year end, we had five portfolio companies on non-accrual, 
with a total fair value of approximately $43.2 million, representing 3.5% of the total debt portfolio. However, this figure includes our investment in Core Scientific at a cost and fair value of $23.2 million and $25.4 million, respectively. Subsequent to year-end, we removed our investment in Core Scientific from non-accrual status after its January 2024 exit from Chapter 11 bankruptcy and our election to receive shares of its common stock in lieu of our debt investment. As we have communicated in the past, in general, we are not equity investors and would anticipate making an orderly sale of our equity position for the benefit of our shareholders. Outside of Core Scientific, our other four non-accrual assets represented only 1.5% of our debt portfolio on a fair value basis. We have a dedicated team of investment professionals who are solely focused on portfolio management and asset quality, and they continue to take a vigilant approach to the quality and overall health of our portfolio companies. We remain confident in their ability to find resolutions that benefit both the portfolio company and our shareholders. At this time, we'd like to open the line for questions. Operator? Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. You may remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing star 2. Once again, that is star 1 if you would like to ask a question, and star 2 to remove yourself. We will pause for just a moment to assemble the question queue. We'll go first to Velas Aram with UBS. Hey, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, for my first one, I just wanted to ask about uh, capital management. So you relevered the balance sheet uh, in, in Q4, um, but also tapped the ATM for equity issuance. So as you think about supporting growth in 24, which uh, you know clearly looks like there's an opportunity to do, um, you know, how do you expect to balance the two? And um, and is that leverage target range still um, the one one to one three that you've talked about before? Hey, Bill, uh, this is Kyle. So um, yeah, we we expect that leverage ratio to be between one and one point three. Uh, I think some of the benefits that we are beginning to experience and will experience further in the future is managing capital off balance sheet, and generating new uh, income gives us the ability to really keep that leverage uh, maybe even lower than um, some of the expectations or some of our, our history, uh, giving us really ample liquidity and to be opportunistic uh, with what uh, the market presents. And so I think that, you know, we're going to continue to build the balance sheet. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, add in equity and leverage uh, appropriately. As you've seen, though, uh, we make sure we do that to the benefit of shareholders uh, that, so that we can continue to increase that dividend and out-earn it. Um, and so that certainly plays into uh, every discussion or thought around building the balance sheet. The only thing I'd la- add to that is also we don't have any immediate maturities on our borrowings, um, but we will look to refinance um, opportunistically throughout 2024 on the debt side. Got it. Helpful. Then um, just on the uh, JV portfolio, so it's um, up about 25 to $30 million or so per quarter. The last couple of quarters, um, around uh, $150 million now, I believe. Is that the pace that um, we should continue to expect as um, you try to get to, um, I think, closer to that $500 million in, the, you know, in capacity? For that uh, portfolio, yeah, I think I think you'll continue to see that uh, be consistent, adding new assets, um, and I think the general theme of adding assets off balance sheet and co-investing alongside of the, the BDC that will just be a regular thing on an ongoing basis, whether it's the JV or a separate entity or separate entities. Okay, thank you. That. We'll go next to Christopher Nolan with Landberg Thalman. Hey, guys. Um, what was the driver for the higher fee income in the quarter? Yeah, uh, it's a combination. Uh, it's Mike Testa here. 
it's a combination of some of the fees from early repayments that came in the quarter. We noted um, HUD-8, and we had another um, nice repayment on a position that was funded um, one or two years ago. So we got a nice repayment on that. But also with our equipment financings in the quarter, we get the benefit of some of the upfront structuring fees that come in at that quarter. So you could see in our um, fundings this quarter skewed to the equipment financing vertical and that um, those fees being recognized in Q4. Great. Um, and then I guess um, turning to Rocket Labs, um, is, is space is, tends to be a very, you know, expensive business. And um, should we see more activity on the space front and for also big funding commitments like that? Yeah, I think, Chris, I'd start, you know, that discussion with just our equipment finance vertical in general, right? You know, as we've, you know, discussed in the past and in other prepared remarks, um, you know, we're looking for you know, mission-critical equipment for, you know, growth stage businesses with, you know, strong investor capitalization support and, and unique technology, and et cetera. So, you know, I think space definitely – uh, fits within that equipment uh, uh, vertical target. And so, you know, to that extent, um, you know, it's, it's an exciting space for us. But, um, you know, we're, we're really focused more on the equipment than any one industry, if that makes sense. Right. And I guess a final question. Um, some of your BDC, technology BDC peers are seeing, you know, just slower deal flow just from, the slowdown in the venture sector. Um, you guys don't seem to be experiencing that. Is that fair to say, Ed? Who would you consider your big, biggest competitors are in the equipment financing area? Hey, Chris, this is Kyle. Um, so I think one of the benefits we have is having these multiple verticals, which really are not all influenced by venture, right? And so um, equipment financing, that is a very different and differentiated business. There's similarities there, but but those are not all venture-backed. Uh, they could be PE-backed. They could be small market, public companies, et cetera. Um, our life science and healthcare business, with us focusing primarily on um, commercialized products, uh, scaling rapidly, kind of post-FDA approval primarily. It's just a different market altogether. Um, and then, so I think we're just we're playing in different uh, boxes than many of our peers. Uh, the venture debt business, I would say, last year was a little bit more challenging, and, uh, and we have seen a lot of you know, tailwinds really over the last couple of quarters there, though. Um, on the equipment financing angle, uh, there's really not notable groups to mention there. It's a pretty um, discombobulated, just uh, smaller smaller peers, not non-public type peers. And so um, I would there's not even a, a single group I would point out that I say we compete directly with. I think we're, we're one of the best in class for VC and PE-backed growth stage companies on the equipment side. Sorry, that's a non-answer. There's just there's not there's not notable groups I'd mention that. Great, thank you. Yeah. We'll go next to Paul Jotton with KBW. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon, guys. Um, just one more on on Rocket Labs. Um, I, just to make sure I heard correctly, it sounded like there was a pretty big pay down, forty eight million or so um, post quarter. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, why why the the sudden um, repayment on the loan was that expected, and uh, is there any sort of fee income associated with that prepayment? So, yeah, I mean, subsequent to uh, the funding, the company raised a significant amount of capital, um, over 300 million of new equity and a convertible note, mm -hmm. and uh, and subsequently paid us down a bit. Um, what was the other part of that question? Yeah, and did we recognize uh, the fee income? income? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, so this was, you know, somewhat scripted, um, Paul, in that, you know, there was a timing issue of the company's need to refinance uh, their prior facility uh, and the timing of the Trinity facility and the tri timing of their additional capital. So, you know, we, we satisfied that need as of year end, and they repaid us $40 million uh, shortly after the first of the year, as we expected. Got it. Thanks for that. That makes sense. Um, 
And then uh, Chris asked a little bit, but I'll, I'll ask again maybe in a different way, um, but 15% or so of the portfolio is in space technology. Um, I, that may be a little bit lower post-quarter with that um, Rocket Labs pay down, but uh, obviously that's a meaningful exposure within the portfolio. Uh, I'm just kind of maybe curious to get, get your thoughts on, I guess, the opportunity, you know, that you think that you see there, and and, uh, and that's all. Sure. Um, so the exposure itself, you could, it could, we could really break it down and uh, show you how granular, really, even within that one industry, our exposure is. So we're financing equipment, right? So we're, we're really focused on companies that are raising significant amount of capital and equity capital. We trail those equity investors, and we find mission-critical pieces of equipment, and that's typically, you know, these are non-specialized pieces of equipment. Uh, they have a use case outside of the company, outside of the industry, um, and we're financing that mission-critical equipment and providing an advance against it that's lower than the value of that equipment generally. So um, even within, uh, you know, uh, the space industry, that's going to be a lot of different pieces of off-the-shelf type equipment, manufacturing equipment, et cetera, um, and pretty diversified even there. And so uh, the exposure uh, to that one industry is really just because there's a significant uh, amount of equity flowing to that particular industry. That particular industry has significant CapEx needs and requirements, which we're able to go in and finance. We're seeing that with infrastructure-type companies as well, and so you'll probably continue to see that, uh, that market and industry expanding for us because there's a lot of equipment needs there as well. So uh, we don't really think about it. Uh, we, 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 you know, we show it as the industry and exposure to that industry, but within it uh, you're talking about a lot of different pieces of mission-critical equipment that have real value whether or not it's with the company or not. Got it. Thanks for that. Um, and last one for me, um, uh, the core scientific shares. Do you guys uh, are you guys subject to any kind of lockup or restriction period with those shares? Uh, this is Kyle again. We we ended uh, Q4 with 5.64 million shares. We are um, not subject to any hold, and uh, we're going to liquidate those shares in a timely manner that makes sense to maximize shareholder value. Got it. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. You bet. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We'll go next to Bryce Rowe with B. Riley. Uh, thanks. Um, good. I guess good afternoon from the East Coast. Um, Wanted to uh, maybe start on a, on a comment you made, Kyle. Um, you said, you know, you're, you're putting larger, more mature companies or they're entering your your investment pipeline. And, you know, I think we've seen, um, you know, obviously, the space deal, equipment finance deal, and then a, and a, another deal here recently that was a little bit larger than, um, than, than what we might see from you all typically. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, that, <clears throat> that process of, you know, larger, more mature companies, you know, entering the pipeline and, you know, what it what it might mean, you know, from a, I guess, from a growth perspective, um, both on balance sheet and uh, and off balance sheet. Yeah. So I think, you know, we really started to see last year, Q1, Q2, um, a pretty significant increase to top of funnel. Uh, we also, in that same uh, vein, we also really tightened up the bottom of the funnel and uh, the requirements for deals to get across the finish line for funding. So, you know, percentage of deals that come in the top and then we fund has actually decreased across the board. Um, but what we've seen are more mature companies that are and probably were capable of getting all of their needs satisfied from a bank uh, are now looking for alternative solutions. And we really are – are positioned well there with a permanent source of capital, the ability to make commitments, follow through on those commitments, um, and uh, uh, so we're just we're positioned really well to provide capital to those companies. Um, so top of the funnel significantly increased quality of deals. Now certainly there's there's some quality of deals that's less attractive that we're you know we're filtering out as well, but we are also seeing a lot of really mature companies. Further down the road, average deal size increased 20% last year uh, for us. 
So it just it kind of it reflects. We also saw significantly more first lien. You know, the majority of our portfolio is first lien, but we we are seeing less less kind of um, second lien type opportunities, which just shows you companies are looking for a different type of solution and alternative type solution to the banks. So uh, we feel good about where we're positioned there. Pipeline is robust, and and we're being you know we're being proactive and we're being opportunistic on what you know we fund. Yeah, and I would add that. You know, we do remain committed to our portfolio granularity. It's something you hear us talk a lot about uh, quarter on quarter, right? And, you know, that we want to be very granular across industry and across financing size, you know, uh, among other things. And so, you know, that's why we felt it was important to clarify the position on Rocket Lab, right, Mm -hmm. Um, to, you know, reassure our investors that we are committed to that level of granularity. Yeah. Yeah, the off-balance sheet vehicles uh, will continue to give us the ability to, yes, grow, check size, of course, but, you know, a lot of that's just making sure we're the incumbent lender. When our companies do really well, we want to keep them. We don't want to lose them to somebody else. We want the ability to fund them and keep funding them in the future and and, uh, continue to help the companies grow. And so, you know, I think you'll see our off-balance sheet vehicles just, um, give us the ability to do that, and then also enter like like this, enter into new transactions at a, a higher price point, while not you know while not risking and in, in putting too much uh, capital into any one any one deal at trend. All right, that's 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 helpful. And maybe maybe a related question, um, you know, I would imagine with the uh, the the funding profile, you know, record record fundings here in 23 sounds like your uh, your pipeline is is really strong. Um, you know, there was some question about kind of liquidity and you know, how you how you you think about your liquidity at this point. But 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 maybe you know, give it give us an idea um, of how you're how you're thinking about funding. And I mean, obviously you have the ATM um, that's up and running and and and, um, and and available with with uh, with a premium price to NAV. Um, but you know, just kind of curious how you think about. You know the, the the debt side of the equation, whether it be you know the secured facility expanding that or um, trying to get more active with the uh, with the unsecured notes market. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's going to be a combination of all those things, right? Um, on the uh, debt side, we're making sure that we've got unsecured secured financing. We're making sure it's tuned out. Uh, we are making sure that uh, we raise equity most efficiently. Um, we have really ample liquidity right now on and off balance sheet. As we've indicated, uh, we are raising additional capital off balance sheet to, to even bolster that liquidity further. Um, we're charging management fees and incentive fees on that capital, which uh, will 100% of that is owned by our shareholders, Trend. So we have and we're creating as many options as possible to give ourselves liquidity, to put ourselves in a position to be opportunistic and grow this platform in a way that's beneficial for our shareholders. We're really focused on that. That's great. That's all for me. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Bryce. We'll return now to Vilas Abraham with UBS. Hey, uh, thanks for the follow-up. I just wanted to ask if there were any updates on on timing, um, specifically on the RIA side of things that you're able to share? Uh, we can't give you timing on exactly um, how the capital is going to be rolled out, how much of it and when. Um, our expectation and guidance has been that we'll start deploying in Q2, and uh, that hasn't changed. Okay. And then I just maybe one last um, you know, kind of bigger picture question. You mentioned life sciences, 14% of the of the book as of as of 12:31. Just how are you thinking about that particular vertical, longer term? I guess the attractiveness of deploying there now, and just longer term, um, the concentration that 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 could get to. Um, and um, yeah, just any color there would be helpful. Yeah. That's great. Uh, we are really excited about our life science and healthcare business. Uh, we see incredible opportunities to grow there, seeing significant equity dollars flow back into that industry. Um, if you think about big picture, you know, what we're doing here, and I mentioned, you know, the different verticals, we really want to see these very, very complementary verticals continue to grow. Um, it, it, from an asset management standpoint, we're really able to diversify our assets so that, you know, we're not we, – 
a bank goes out of business or there's volatility in one sector, it's not going to have a, a massive impact on our overall business. And so we're really focused on diversifying into these different verticals and growing each of them uh, respectively. And so you'll continue seeing life science build. You'll see um, some of that exposure or overall percentage probably grow as we build that business. And you'll see further diversification across the platform into these complementary verticals. Okay, thank you. Yep. We'll go next to Casey Alexander with Compass Point. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, you mentioned that second lien is, is a shrinking part of your portfolio, but still 23% of your portfolio, if I read the release right, which is still one of the higher amounts in the venture debt space. So I'm curious how that, that, that splits between secured lending and equipment finance and sort of what's the, the typical kind of structure that has you, you, you know, end up in a second lien position um, and makes you feel comfortable there? Yeah, Jerry and I will just ping pong on this one a little bit. Um, so, Casey, the way we think about second lien deals, these are going to be some of our stronger transactions. None of those are equipment financing. So those are all secured loans, uh, okay, term loans. Yeah. They're all they're on the tech lending uh, vertical. And, you know, typically that's us just partnering with the bank. They're, they may be providing receivable financing. And the overall cost of capital, it's lower. Uh, it provides more runway for the company. And um, we are typically going into those because they're just very strong deals where a bank is willing and able to put some of the capital. And so um, we generally go into those deals with the mindset that we're willing to do the whole thing. Um, and if it came down to it, we could pay, the, pay off the bank. That's just our – that's how we look at it. Um, but having a bank in there, partnering with a bank, and providing a lower cost of capital is just overall better for the company. And so it's a way that we – partner and, and do business with the banks, um, and it's also a way to benefit the company by extending the runway further. Do you have the right to buy the bank out of their position? Generally, we do. Or, you know, and I would say, uh, you know, our working relationships with the bank is such that, you know, even if that was not explicitly in the docs, I would expect that to be, you know, an option that they would they would gladly take up. But typically – uh, that is included in our docs. Okay, thank you. That's my only question. You bet. Thanks, Casey. And that will conclude today's question and answer session. At this time, I'd like to turn the call back over to Kyle Brown, Chief Executive Officer, for any closing or additional remarks. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, we're proud of our 2023 results and feel like we've laid the groundwork over the last 18 months to scale this business in a unique and profitable way for investors. Uh, lastly, our management team will be in New York and Boston later this month, and we look forward to meeting uh, with any investors and key stakeholders. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Ben to schedule a meeting. Like, we'd like to thank everybody for joining and participating in our call today. We appreciate your interest and investment in Trinity Capital. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's program. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.